Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. Um, am I ready, Kenny? Am I in time? I am. I'm late. Good. So, calc, calc threading. So this is what I'm going to say. Um, so it's uh, not interesting. It's an index. But here's the disclaimer. Pretty much all of this was done by uh, Tor Lilquist and Dennis Francis, who, uh, neither of whom can be here today, which is a great shame. Um, but I, I was uh, partly irresponsible for them uh, and helped too. So here we go. So calc is a pretty interesting code base. Obviously, like everything else, it's 30 plus years old. Um, the data structures have improved a huge amount recently in the last three, four years. Um, but there's still some significant scope for improvement there. We'll look at how they are uh, in a bit. Uh, but the calculation engine has been left pretty much as is. We tried to tack another one on the side to do OpenCL calculation and compiling formulae to, to OpenCL. Um, but it's been badly in need of love. And so we'll look a little bit how it works and how we improved it to thread it. So since uh, LibreOffice 4.3, the data structures have looked pretty much like this. You have a document, which is, I guess, your spreadsheet. Uh, inside it, you have a whole series of sheets, which are called tables. Um, so several tabs, I guess, along the bottom. And then we have columnar, column, anyway, columns, uh, which, are, which are stored something like this. So there's a whole array, actually a fixed size array, rather a large one, uh, of columns. And then down it, we have these uh, wonderful multidimensional data structures that are sort of spans of contiguous uh, types. Uh, in chunks going down there. So we have things like uh, blocks of strings or chunks of doubles or uh, you know, various other things. But we'll really be looking at the formula cell, uh, the formula cell stuff uh, today. So inside those formula cells, you have a whole run of these formula cells, bang, 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 like this. Um, but we try and group information uh, together about them. So there's a token array. And the token array basically represents your formula. You know, so you have equals, sum, 1, 2, 3. And uh, there's two representations of that. The first thing is a, a, a token array like this. Uh, and these tokens are the same tokens in a different order. So this one would be, you know, sum, one, two, three. Uh, and the reverse Polish equivalent, which would be one, two, three, sum. Uh, of course, this is quite a simple example. Uh, there are, you know, a lot more twisted ways. But the, the nice thing about the reverse Polish is you don't have to do any complicated stuff. You execute this, this uh, stuff, pushing and pulling to a simple stack uh, as you calculate. So, yeah, there's a whole load of different things like this. But the, the key things, I guess, are things like single references, like get a, get a cell from A1 or whatever. Double reference, getting a range of cells. And this can, of course, go three-dimensional ranges through uh, multiple sheets. Uh, there are special cases for external references from other things. And, of course, simple numbers, strings, and then operations like do a division or uh, you know, execute this macro uh, with these parameters. And here's how it works. So when we want to calculate a formula, um, we, we uh, well, there are, there are several ways of triggering this. But one way is to just get a value out of a cell. So you ask a cell, give me your value. And uh, if it's uh, just a simple double or something in this, this array, then, well, we just pass the double back. But if it's a formula, we need to check if we actually need to calculate the results. So this maybe interpret stuff goes, well, maybe we should actually recalculate before we uh, return the double. And uh, that eventually ends up into uh, interpret. And then there's an amazing recursion flattening thing here, which I'll talk about later. Um, and eventually it ends up in a thing called interpret tail. Uh, and that creates an interpreter object on the heap, um, passes the code in it, which is the token array, where it is in the document, all this other good stuff, and uh, does interpret on it. Interpret then, of course, starts building this stack of these reverse Polish uh, tokens, execute those one by one. And as part of that process, you recall that some of these things are go get data out of the sheet somewhere else. Yeah? As part of that, sometimes we recurse back up to here, and we find something else that needs another cell. So if you imagine a case such as an entire column, and someone types 42 in A1, and then they type equals A1 in A2, and they fill this all the way down so you have a million formulae, all of which refer to the last one. And then you call get value on the very bottom cell as you're trying to draw the screen or, or, or whatever. Um, this then potentially can recurse a million deep down your stack. And it's not a very shallow uh, recursion. And so there is this, quotes amazing recursion flattening here, which goes, eh, you know, we recursed quite a lot at this point. Uh, we're starting to panic about how much heap we've got. Maybe we should do something creative, you know, and uh, rearrange what we're doing in some way so as to defer work and come back and do some more later and hopefully 
uh, complete. So there's some, there's some, some fun stuff there that probably doesn't bear <clears throat> over much thought, uh, but it's just a, a bit irritating. And of course, that's just a single column. You can imagine much worse uh, situations where you have these very deep uh, traces. So uh, you recall that actually all of these tokens are arranged into a formula cell group, and we know how big this thing is. We know it spans a whole column. So perhaps we could do better. So there's this thing called interpret formula group um, that in various cases is called, and should be called more frequently, but there are future plans for that. And this essentially can do something different. So the existing OpenCL and software cases then can try and interpret a great chunk of this group at once. And to do that, what we do is we, uh, we call get value, this thing that can recurse, as you recall, on all of our input. So we can look at the formula group, and we can go, well, this formula only operates on one cell, but as we go down the column, that cell will actually turn into all of these other cells. So as it goes down, we should fetch all of this data at once and pack it away into a matrix. So this works nicely for simple string and, and, and double values. And we pack all of that into a nice, flat, uniform chunk of memory. So instead of looking at formula cells and doing operations for each of them, we have just an array of doubles. And then, <clears throat> so, so yeah. first of all, we check that it's safe to do this for some value of safe. And uh, you know, we, we think that this is a formula that we can optimize and that this, this set of tokens is safe to do this stuff with. Uh, we get those values, and then we can choose. We can send those to OpenCL, so we can push those across to your GPU. Uh, we can compile these tokens to uh, some clever OpenCL kernel. And we can shove all that data in, and we can get the results back. And in some cases, that works really well and is really fast. In other cases, compiling the kernel is slower than actually uh, ex executing it. So you don't win. It depends on the shape of your sheet. And so we have some, some stuff now that tries to judge the weight of a formula. How much work is it really doing? Um, is it a, a simple copy, memory copy, in which case copying it to the GPU and back again is not, you know, not going to help? Um, or is it a more complicated uh, function? Uh, and then we've got a software version, too, uh, that does some kind of accelerated, you know, SSE accelerated summing uh, across these things in some, some nice way. Yeah. And um, as, we, as we calculate these things on the software stack down here, we, we manipulate this matrix so that it looks different, but we don't do any copying. So we have a sort of abstract matrix that Kendi uh, created over here at, uh, <coughs> very late at night in a, uh, before a deadline to make this work uh, very beautifully. So, um, and it turns out to be very efficient, as we'll see later. So why thread? Well, we need thread because, well, sometimes CPUs get actually slower. You know, the megahertz goes down, the IPC goes down, but hey, I've got another three cores that aren't doing anything, you know, which is good for thermal management, perhaps. You can move to a cool core always. But um, anyway, uh, the process clocks are anyhow stymied pretty much at uh, four gigahertz. You're not going to get much faster than that. So they're all going uh, very much wider. And so if you want an IPC improvement, uh, because instructions per clock are, are pretty much, uh, well, they're not improving hugely, even with all this clever speculative execution that we're so fond of uh, these days. Um, <clears throat> so, so the good news is that uh, AMD is really uh, you know, sort of stirring up this market and providing new high IPC, widely threaded uh, stuff. Laptops, you know, I, I think arguably have a you know, four-thread sort of minimum. The mid-range stuff is eight threads. Workstations, 16 threads. I mean, it, it's, it's cheap. I, I meet people that buy these things. Your new PC will have more threads than you, you know what to do with. Uh, and so, of course, AMD has been trying to help uh, make sure that those are used, used effectively. So Marcus, my, uh, my, my friend at the back here is a hero who created this crash reporting thing. And we, we were looking at the statistics uh, uh, the other night to see, well, how many cores do people have? And frustratingly, um, CPUs are very good at repointing their core count, but not their thread count. So... Some of these are hyper-threaded cores and some aren't, which is really irritating. So I, I wanted to show you how many threads people actually have that are spare. Um, but the bad news is that some people still have one, <clears throat> one core, although I'd like to think it's hyper-threaded, so they have at least uh, two threads. Um, as you can see, there's a sort of declining number of people with two or potentially four threads. Uh, and then there's, well, there's really quite a lot of people here with four or maybe four cores that are weak. Uh, I don't know. But either way, you see the picture. This, this guy is growing and will grow more. Um, if we enlarge the very small bit at the top, <clears throat> the trend is even more encouraging. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, 48 CPU machines. Uh, we even got some 80-core 80, 80 uh, guys that seem to be crashing. So I, I don't know whether you can extrapolate from the crash data that more threads means you crash more often. It's quite possible. Um, and maybe we get less reliable as we go. But, but either way, the idea is that everything is, uh, is getting more... Um, 
more threaded. So we should use that stuff. So, so threading interpret formula group. So, so what we really wanted to do was reuse the existing formula core rather than creating more special cases off at the side. Uh, we wanted to uh, take that and avoid too much uh, subsetting and ideally remove the software interpreter as well so that it could be, you know, collapse everything in. So that's how we started out. So, so, so the idea basically is that we pre-calculate our dependent cells much as now, but instead of stuffing them all into a matrix in a, in a strange way, um, we just leave them where they are. We're, we're confident that when we go to get them, maybe interpret will return false, and so we don't need to worry. We can just use the existing code. Um, of course, if maybe interpret actually calls interpret and we recurse, there's a big old assertion there that goes bang, and the whole thing falls in a heap. And uh, we've been catching a few of these assertions in the crash testing, which is exciting. Um, then, of course, there's some functions that are horrible, and we have the blacklist. Um, but we could pra parallelize essentially reusing the existing code, uh, which, which, is, which is pretty nice. So the schema goes something like this. You call all your get values at the beginning so that subsequently all your maybe interprets will return false or not, not do anything and just give you the raw value. Uh, again, the amazing recursion flattening, I think, uh, we actually implemented this time. And so then in interpret tail, uh, you, you start to parallelize. Uh, mm, uh, okay, as, as you interpret this whole group, you can call this in multiple threads after you've set everything up nicely uh, at the beginning. Um, so yeah, so that's, that was basically the plan. And there's a, a nice big assert here that says, don't do it if the threaded group calc is in progress. So that sounds good. Um, the only problem is, it turns out, <clears throat> when you look into it, that the nice pictures of here are not quite as wonderful. So the SC interpreter, for example, mutates the actual formula as it calculates it. So due to a fit of cunning, the iteration variable is actually in the token itself. So uh, we, we are actually in the token array itself. Of course, there's a whole load of complicated stuff going on. You know, there are macros being called that in theory can do anything, right? They can, they can mutate the document, the table, the cells, the thing that you're in right now. Um, some of the functions mutate the dependency graph, which is, again, uh, tied to the document and a disaster. And so, yeah, so we were really rather keen to have simple locking uh, that didn't require lots of highly granular locking everywhere, particularly if that's going to be in the, um, the common single-threaded case that, that's also uh, still used. So we're eager to, to make it well, <clears throat> relatively simple. So, so we cleaned up uh, the, this magic of having the, the current index inside the instance of the token array that you're iterating over. You're like, this first, this is an iterator start. Give me the first one, and then you call get next, get next, and it's, it's mutating the thing itself. So we now have a nice external uh, iterator. Uh, we have mutation guards everywhere that are essentially designed to sort of crash and lock hard, you know, if they ever see a mutation that occurs while this, uh, this threaded calculation is going on. And so we add those, sprinkle those liberally in scary-looking places. Um, the, yeah, so by turning various things off, indirects, offset, match, and so on, um, and actually VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP generate new dependencies as they calculate. So we turn those off. Um, macros we disable for now. I mean, if you look at what Excel does, they look at the macro code and go, ah, oh, this is a pure function. It doesn't mutate stuff. So actually, Excel doesn't allow macros that do stupid stuff to be called informally, but we're not quite as uh, advanced as that. What would be even nicer would be to parallelize the basic interpreter, but that's quite an exciting, uh, exciting problem. There are people out there in the industry that would love to have parallel macro execution because their quant uses these weird functions for, uh, you know, pricing Greeks or whatever, and they want, uh, want that quicker. Um, yeah, there's a whole load of uh, stuff. At the moment, we allow external UNO extensions to be called uh, because, well, they're just as bad as macros, but they probably don't exist. So if they're, uh, that's all right, you know. Um, we should probably turn that off. Um, there are even more nasties, uh, more, more global variables left and right. Uh, and as we started to look at these, there's nowhere obvious to hang them that would actually be sensible. So we have a whole load of thread local variables uh, for the calculation stack, current document being calculated, matrix positions, and a, and a few more. Um, we had to upgrade the Mac toolchain to make thread local variables work, uh, which is slightly uh, unfortunate. Um, and eventually, we then thought we'd introduce an SC interpreter context that became more and more things that we wanted to hang somewhere uh, to optimize and perform, improve performance. And so now we pass a, an interpreter context through many of the functions and try, try and make that add up. So how did it go? Well, initially, um, it, it did quite well. So, so this, is the, uh, this is the single-threaded uh, calculation. This is the same performance with just one thread. So, you know, hopefully this will be 
reasonably flat. Um, there's two things here. There's my Linux uh, laptop, and then there's some Ryzen 16-core monster. And there's several things you can see here, which are probably better, actually, on a log plot. But if you draw the log plot, you see this going very nicely linearly downwards until you hyperthread, at which point, yeah, you know, it doesn't really speed up a whole lot. You can see this flatten off massively at the end um, because we're really hammering this thing quite hard. Uh, such that the hyperthreading uh, doesn't work well, so well in this. Of course, this is because it's doing a big SSC. Um, this, this test is just a large sum, and it's doing a lot of double work. Um, hyperthreading probably helps you more in other, other uh, use cases, but at the moment we turn that off, uh, and it, uh, it actually speeds things up. So, so, yeah, so to this point, then, we have had uh, four uh, sets of calculations. So we could do a plain old calculation, single threading. We could have the software uh, group threaded, uh, sing single threaded calculation. So again, aggregate stuff in matrix, calculate. And we have the OpenCL thing, and now we have the new threaded calculation. Look at all these nice acronyms I've added. And then, horror of horrors, uh, on benchmarking it, we discovered that sometimes the new threaded calculation, which is all shiny and pretty and, oh, you know, doing no locking really at all and absolutely wonderful, um, was slower than the single threaded calculation with the software group interpreter. Uh, so that's pretty depressing after some, you know, month of uh, uh, work. Um, yeah, and it turns out that actually the process of collecting all that data from the sheets, checking its types, fooling around, uh, looking at uh, uh, format types and so on and so on for each formula cell is really expensive. And often it's done again and again and again for these things where you have an N squared, so you're doing a big operation on a, on a column, and then you're doing it multiple times as you go down. And, yeah... And A, of course, collects it once, and then it's hyper-optimized as a C goodness, you know, really uh, whipping through, through that. So, <clears throat> so we then threaded the A version as well. So instead of having a single-threaded software group interpreter, we threaded that as well, and then suddenly life was, was good again. Um, so I, I, I got a picture of uh, some of that in a minute and how, how the uh, stats looked. So, uh, why we, so, so then we sit there and we're going, well, it's all very well getting a, you know, a 6x, but we've got eight threads. Why aren't we getting an 8x you know, or a 9x, ideally? You, know, you hear about these sort of super linear speed-ups due to extra cash use. Um, they, they, they read well in the textbooks, don't they? Um, so, um, so we start looking on Windows, and there's absolutely terrible profiling tools there. But um, on Linux, we use perf. Um, but looking for thread issues is not entirely obvious. Of course, if you've got lock contention... Um, you know, there's a lot of time spent sleeping, but it's not real time. You know, like the kernel is going off and counting sheep instead. Um, and that doesn't really show up easily on many of the profiling tools. Um, so there are a whole load of different events you can look at, and you can look at um, sort of bouncing of uh, kernel, uh, uh, of futex memory uh, locations between uh, threads, I guess. And there's, there's various things like that, but we, we spent a lot of time, and eventually perf turned out to be the, probably the best thing uh, to help help with this. And looking for things like false sharing, where you, you've tried to separate your memory, but because you, your allocator is smart, it shoves all the same size things in the same place next to each other, and they all end up in the same cache line, and then this bounces between all your cores. So we tried, we tried looking at a lot of these things, and uh, with, with not a vast amount of success, but here were some of the horrors we found. So, so most of the threading things that we were looking for didn't turn out to be terribly, uh, you know, findable. But the other stuff was, was pretty silly. So as you operate on this reverse Polish stack, we were uh, regularly just allocating and freeing things all the time as we did it. Uh, and, yeah, the, using, using the, huh, actually using the system allocator instead of Matthias Huchwan here really sped things up, particularly for, for parallel use there. So we dropped the custom allocator. And after that, we also uh, reused these tokens where possible. So, so why bother allocating and freeing hundreds of double tokens when you just did that just before? So we have a little, a little stash of some. Uh, so there's no need to take a lock. Uh, you can just reuse the thing. Um, another particular folly that people like is to use standard stack, because it sounds like if you're making a stack, that's what you want, right? But let me tell you, if your use case is to extend and grow a stack like this, you know, uh, you exactly don't want a stack, because uh, underneath it, it uses a DQ, which has got a list inside it. So every time you push something on it, it allocates a new node. And when you're multiply threaded, what you really don't want is to be constantly hammering your allocator left and left and right to allocate and free all these tiny nodes and chain them together, just use a vector. Very nice. Uh, a win just comes out of that. And then, of course, the interpreter context, which starts to cache these things, was being freed and reallocated. So just by, by saving some of these things, we, uh, we got a, a lot better. Um, so there are some other particularly uh, 
awful things. Uh, so we see the SFX item set, which is a favorite of Bjorn's and, uh, and many others, um, appearing right in the middle of uh, the interpreter. Uh, so, you know, people are doing get number format on cells as they do this arithmetic, which shouldn't need to be uh, used at all. So this get cell value or zero is in, inside the get value, uh, get value function. And it just, um, it just does some, some really crazy stuff, you know, like... <laughs> uh, and it's, it's really unclear why it needs to do this. And you, you start uh, looking into this, and it's, it's really... Uh, it's, rather, it's rather frightening. So anyway, here's, here's a sort of performance story. So, so as we threaded, uh, your time wants to get lower if you want to get faster. So, so we did all this nice threading work, and this is the first step of a recent master, I guess. And some sheets got massively faster, which is good, you know. So we're going from, I don't know, way up here to way down here, maybe, you know, maybe twice as fast, which is great. Uh, but at the same time, a whole lot of other sheets got slower, which seems strange. Um, the reason they got slower was that we turned off the software interpreter. So that was doing this nice pre-gather and then sum and then uh, push it back. So by threading the software interpreter, then we managed to get back, you know, uh, some of this stuff. Stopping thrashing the token array, halving the number of threads. So, so getting rid of hyper-threading took us to here. So flat, flattish for some loads and big wins uh, for others. So getting rid of hyper-threading, we just use half the number of threads, and the OS knows what to do uh, on its own. Uh, custom allocator again, big wins for some, maybe a slight win, lot loss for others. Um, caching, formula double tokens, various other Lots of commits that don't do anything. Isn't that nice? You know, so uh, it's good to uh, it's good to know you're making a difference as you uh, as you do these refactors. <clears throat> and uh, what else? Yeah, C plus plus threads, various other other things at the end. But still, overall, pretty pretty good. Uh, coming down from you know sort of I don't know six six hundred milliseconds down to 150 for for this one, and you know 1600 1. 1.6 seconds down to uh, less than half a second, and or well, around half a second, and so on. So yeah. So that's pretty much the thing. And what should we next? Well, yeah, the crash testing loads these 100,000 documents, and it uh, asserts uh, liberally left and right. Um, almost certainly implicit intersection is killing us. So implicit intersection is a, is a clever way of writing formulae wrong and uh, calc noticing this and correcting them as it calculates. I simplify. But, uh, yeah, people can deliberately use it, I suppose, but I don't know why they would. And... Uh, <clears throat> So the reason is that they write a smaller range than there is actually ends up being used. And so when we look at our dependents, we don't pre-calculate stuff, and then multiple threads get caught in this assert of, oh dear, we're fetching this data and it's not calculated. Um, yeah, well, I, I like to kill those global variables. That's actually probably relatively easy for a, a newbie to do. Maybe it should be an easy hack uh, now, because uh, we've got this nice context to put them on. Um, yeah. Uh, big stuff, like killing the formula cell and making it a formula cell group, uh, one of these groups that just happens to be one long, uh, would be kind of nice, and then maybe be able to simplify some of these, uh, these pieces, uh, and making the plain old calculation uh, just a single-threaded threaded calculation. Uh, and, and finally, getting rid of this format type stuff that should never be happening uh, at all during calculation, um, I think. So, that's about it. That are the conclusions. They're kind of obvious. Um, yeah, one, one point here is that it's actually just an economic problem. Uh, unfortunately, uh, technology is fun and all that, but, you know, just being able to uh, invest in optimizing this thing, as soon as you open the profiler, you start thinking, why is it doing that? That's really silly. Um, so, yeah, just thanks then to AMD for supporting it. That's my talk. Any questions? Sir, you have a finger up. No? No? You're trying not to look like a questioner. Okay. Anyone else? The first person has to be brave, but uh, after that, it's easy. No? How many threads do, do people have? I'm going to do a poll, since you're all static. Uh, does anyone have a single-threaded uh, laptop or, or, or CPU they're using at all? OK. You know, it's your main work PC. Oh, you, you do. OK, it's the Raspberry Pi 1, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I thought, I thought it would be. Excellent. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, your, your phone is, is ancient, yeah, the 4K phone. So how about two? Okay. Uh, with two cores, four <laughs> and is, okay, so I, I'm, I'm talking threads, so let's do, do threads. So, so two, two threads. Um, anyone with two threads? There's this guy. And that's what you actively use in your day to day work? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, so it's not, I once had a BBC Micro 6502 8 bit. I'm talking the, uh, you know, sort of, yeah, yeah, what we use. Um, so, uh, uh, four? Who, who's good for four? Four, yeah, there's some more. Eight? That's me. 16? 
Okay, starts to top out at this point. Any, any can do better than 16 on their workstation? Bjorn, tell me, you know, 64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes. So, see, so that that is true. See, so there's thermal management in in these things. Um, yeah. However, <laughs> arguably, it is better to be uh, yeah more efficient and get it done quicker, and then idle the thing rather than have it going for a long old time. Um, arguably, race to idle, so they say. But who knows? Race to idle. Well, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the the hurry up and wait. It's like the military approach to power saving. You know. Yeah. Good. That was, uh, that was not a question, but that was a good statement. Thanks, Olivia. Anything else? We've got another three minutes. Sir? Okay. Wow. Could we integrate LLVM to, to compile the formulae? Yeah, I think so. So th there is, in fact, an LLVM compiling the formulae solution already built in. Uh, but it's typically known as software OpenCL. Um, and if you look under the hood of these OpenCL implementations, what you rapidly discover is that it, it, it's pretty much that. The, the problem is, of course, it's not a perfect match uh, for what we do. And in terms of our, formulae, uh, our fu formula engine, is heavily built around a lot of the concepts I've showed you in terms of the stack and, and how, how these things are passed. And so, you know, the sign function is not a C function that's like double, do the sign, take double. It's like a, have this hammer, bag of hammers of, of things you could get, and what if you pass a boolean to it, and what if you pass a, you know, a string, or, you know, it's sort of all shoved into that formula. And so, in terms of code reuse and simplification, it's not, not ideal. But Marcus has, uh, you know, Marcus is our calc hero maintainer. You know, wave a hand, Marcus, so people harass you afterwards. And, uh, you know, so, so he probably has a, a, a more detailed view. But yeah, it, it's, it's a good idea, perhaps. Um, but, but we'd like to simplify. Mark, Marcus. Yeah, I think it only works with standardized data. Yeah. Uh, and that's the big problem with the fact that we have all types of data being uh, integrated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a whole load of refactoring we can do to carry on this improvement and make it to the point that we could have uh, something much, much sweet here. Um, but yeah, I think the wins LLVM will give you are small compared to the refactoring the core uh, core fund. <coughs> good. Well, if there's nothing else, thanks so much. You've been very good.